like to welcome everyone here this afternoon to the continuation of the oral portion of the National Energy Board's OH002-2015 hearing regarding the proposed Enbridge Pipelines Line 3 replacement program. We're pleased to have with us this afternoon the George Gordon First Nation to present their oral traditional evidence. Uh, my name is Jamie Ballum and I'm the chair of the panel. To my left is member Mike Richmond and to my right is member Peter Watson. <coughs> Before proceeding, I understand there will be an opening prayer. Chief Longman? Actually, it'll be uh, Mr. McNabb. Great. That would be great. Thank you. <coughs> You can just remain seated, say a prayer in each your own ways, whichever ways you were taught. Pray for the homeless, the hungry of this world. Pray for those that are sick in hospitals. And also pray for our fighting men and women overseas, the people that are going hungry over there, no places to run to. Some of them are coming to our country and to the USA. Say a prayer for them also. And say a prayer for those that have lost loved ones. That the Creator would give them comfort. And say a prayer for your families, our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, those of us that have them. And say a prayer for yourselves also. Say a prayer in each your own ways. May this meeting be, be in good faith to each and every one that's concerned. And we ask the Creator to bless each and every one of us and those elsewhere. Hi, hi. Thank you very much, Elder Mike McNabb. In addition to the panel, we have a number of board staff here with us today, and I'd like to introduce some of them to you. Uh, Matt Groza and Nancy McWhorter are our process advisors, and if you have any questions, if you had questions or have more questions about the process, they're the people to talk to. Our hearing manager is Christine Davidson, and she'll take care of any other administrative issues if you have any. One of the, state, the priorities that we have in any of our board hearings or functions is the safety of the people that are taking part. In the unlikely event that there's an evacuation call from, to evacuate the building, if you would go out through the entrance that you come in, just outside the door there's a hallway to the right where a set of stairs and another one by the, uh, the elevators. Once you're outside, if you go to the Central Memorial Park, which is two blocks south of here, and that's the gathering spot, and we would like to make sure that each party uh, sees that all of their people are there so that we <clears throat> it's easier for our security people to make sure everybody's out of the building. And also, as important as other things, the washrooms. You have to go by the elevator bank, and take a left at the end of the hall, and they're down there. Uh, a live portion, of, a live stream of the oral portion will be broadcast on the board's website today, and we welcome anyone who's listening in. There will be electronic transcripts available at the end of the day. It's important that we make sure we have a safe and respectful environment so that all participants, the panel, Enbridge, and others can hear from the presenters in a respectful way and we would ask that uh, people respect their presentation. Our plan this afternoon is to sit until approximately 
to hear your presentation. Um, if, uh, if possible, we're going to want to take a break about halfway through. But if there's a natural break in your presentation, just let us know and we'll, we're not hard and fast on that time. It'll be more suited to what your presentation is. Before any oral traditional evidence, we will ask each presenter to swear or affirm that the information they're presenting is accurate and truthful to the best of their knowledge and belief. And once you've completed your presentation, to ask questions for clarity if, if we need to. Uh, before we turn to George Gordon First Nations presentation, I would invite the Enbridge representatives to introduce themselves. My name is Robert Bourne, and with me is Don Davies, and we're both counsel for Enbridge. And any other interveners? I was going to wait to see if, sorry. <laughs> Just. Serena Boutros from Natural Resources Canada, representing the federal government. Okay, I don't see any other interveners. Are there any preliminary matters? Don't see anything. Seeing none, I'll turn it over to George Gordon, First Nation, for their presentation. Sorry, that's the third time, and I'm going to not get it right. I have to call on Ms. Wong to swear or affirm the uh, presenters. Solomon's here. <clears throat> Do you solemnly affirm that the evidence you're about to give relating to the matters in question shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Please state your full name. Scott Barnes. Do you solemnly affirm that the evidence you're about to give relating to the matters in question shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. Please state your full name. Sean Longman. Do you solemnly affirm that the evidence you are about to give relating to the matters in question shall be the truth, the whole truth, and the whole truth? Yes. Thank you. State your name, please. Hugh Pratt. Do you solemnly affirm that the evidence you are about to give relating to the matters in question shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Now we're ready to proceed. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the board for giving us this opportunity and Enbridge for attending. Um, basically, we're going to have, I don't think we're going to take three hours. Um, we're going to have a fairly brief presentation. Um, Elder McNabb is going to provide um, traditional, world traditional evidence. Um, Solomon Sear is going to speak to the issues of. Um, stewardship and partnership and I'll wrap up with a real brief statement on um, how we foresee taking this traditional knowledge and instituting it into actual active stewardship and that will probably conclude it um, obviously unless there's any questions from Enbridge. So with that uh, Elder McNabb I'd like to call on you to provide some oral evidence, oral traditional evidence Basically, um, what we talked about at Trans Canada earlier this month, same thing. Yep. Yeah. Years ago back, all the natives that lived across Canada here, it was all sacred ground. And when we ran out of something in our area, we went to them and we made a deal with them of some kind to share whatever we, we had for what they had. So that's how I was brought up. I was brought up in the old-fashioned way and I'm a residential school survivor. I'll tell you one thing. When I, came, when I ran away from that place, I hated every white man that I seen for the treatment I was given in that thing. Then after I was out, I lived in the States for 16 years. I was in the American Armed Forces for three. Not all are bad. There's good and bad in all of us. 
But the way we are, we are treated from the European, they called us heathens, lazy Indians, dumb Indians, savage Indians. And the thing that I see today, I just read a little message on some signboard that I was coming, something about an, a massacre. You know, when, uh, when we've done our thing and if we happen to win, it was called a massacre. When the white man defeated us, they called it a, a victory. You know why? What's the difference from winning one fight to another? We're all human beings. You cut me, I bleed. I cut you, you bleed the same as me. Someday I might want a transfusion from one of you guys, and maybe your blood will help me, and vice versa. You know, I grew up in a pretty cruel world, especially with residential schools. We had priests and ministers. They treated us the same blasted way and worse than anybody that I've ever seen. We've never needed a theologian or a minister or a priest to tell us that there was a power higher than us. We knew that for hundreds of years prior to the European landing in our lands. And the traditional lands, they ran from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean to the icebergs in the north. And we all shared that at one time. Some of our people made that trip to the north, some didn't. We all made our different trips across this great land of ours, and we shared everything in trade. There was hardly any money back in them days, according to my grandparents. And we shared with each other. We didn't let one go without and one become more than the other. And we expect to be treated that way. All this land that we're sitting on today was once traditional. From one tribe to the next. The Algonquins went, uh, uh, welcomed the Europeans to our lands in the Atlantic. And after they made friends with them, what did they do? They hunted them for Sunday sport and killed them. They just about wiped out the Algonquin nation all except for a few. Now, history doesn't tell us a darn thing about that. Yet, that's history to us, because it was passed from one tribe to the next. The same thing in the U.S. of America. They hunted the Sioux for Sunday sport. And we never gave them the permission beneath the depth of a plow to take the minerals of this land. In our treaties, that was all that was said in, the, in our Treaty 4 area. Nothing deeper than the depth of a plow. Today we're going miles underground. You know, we all want to be treated equal. We don't want to be held and, be, and become welfare recipients. Those of us that are on it, are called welfare bums. And you know, there, you guys outnumber us 10 to 1. There's as many, probably in this city, in Regina, Saskatoon, you name it. There's Europeans that's on welfare. Do they call them welfare bums? No. Now, we're going to welcome 25,000 Syrians. You know, them people are getting more than we ever got. Their housing is free, their education is free, which is ours too. Their living is free. And how many jobs are you going to give them people when they come here and, and will be treated as a third class nation again? I don't, I don't, I'm not condemning anyone. Them people have no place to go. 
no homes to live in. I just said a prayer for them, those that were running from their homelands to try and find a comfortable place to live. And Canada is giving them all that. Canada has never given us as much as, as the refugees. Never. And we're dealing here with some kind of a pipeline. I don't know much about it. And I'd like to see equalness with both you and our First Nations. Because what you stand to make is not millions. It's going to be trillions. And we understand that. We never gave up that. But the government back in them days overstepped us. They dishonored our treaties. And now we're trying to get them back. Kind of a little bit late, but I hope in the future that they will recognize that. So to you is be fair with the, with the first uh, people that were here in this country for hundreds of thousands of years. There was an excavation done in Fort Capel in one of the hillsides there. They found some old campsites there. And then the campsites date back 8,000 years. Now that's a hell of a long time. We've only been here for a short time, according to them. So this land was occupied long before the Europeans ever came. And we shared it with you, and we'd like to share your royalties with us. Tipsy. Thank you, Mike. Um, I'd like to call on Solomon Sierra to talk a little bit more about uh, stewardship and some other issues, and we'll go from there. Thanks. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I, before I begin, I'd like to um, recognize the elder for giving us that portion of this presentation. I'd also like to recognize Chief Sean Longman, who's here with us today, and also Councillor Hugh Pratt, who's here. And of course, uh, extend appreciation and gratitude to the scientific and very important work that Dr. Scott Barnes does on behalf of the George Gordon First Nation with respect to this particular project. As a member of the First Nation who's involved in the engagement portion um, of this type of activity, I just want to state for the record and make sure that it's registered with the record that George Gordon First Nation is eager and pleased to engage any open process that gives our First Nation the opportunity to identify any risks and work with any proponent that is prepared to work with us to mitigate any identified risks. So in the arrangement and the association we have with the proponent, um, we are appreciative of the fact that we can move forward um, to engage this process, but also to engage in study of traditional land use and our historical usage of our traditional territories and occupancy lands. Through, uh, through engagement, um, there's going to be a very important legacy, I believe, for our First Nation. That in the sense that we have the ability to move forward to scientifically understand and map our traditional territories and use that information in a geopolitical context, not only for our interests, but for the national economic interest and for the local surrounding economic interest as well. We have, um, we have seen the history of the National Energy Board since the late 1950s. This would be the first time that First Nations in this particular region with respect to any of these pipelines within any of the existing right-of-ways, in particular this right-of-way, um, has been engaged. And so we're excited for the opportunity to be here and to participate in this process. When we think about the duty to consult, when we think about the federal framework that protects First Nations' interests and rights, then most certainly this body, National Energy Board, is important and critical. 
on a level of consultation. That at the same time, we know that the George Gordon First Nation will always see the Crown as the main entity that has the responsibility associated with consultation. And we know that the National Energy Board fulfills and executes a certain level of consultation. And uh, as I said in the beginning of my comments, George Gordon First Nation is eager and pleased to engage any open process that gives us the ability to voice our concerns and work with the proponents to bring forward any concerns so that we may mitigate any potential risk. Now, when we talk about stewardship of the land, that is our key and most fundamental message, is that we want to ensure that stewardship obligations on our part are upheld, but also the stewardship obligations on the part of the proponent are upheld as well. And when we talk about partnership, that is one of the terms that we use with CTWAC, and that means partnership. We want to work with the proponent in partnership to ensure that such stewardship obligations are, are recognized, identified, and executed. So with that, I just really wanted to be brief, and I wanted to state this and register it for the record. So with that, thank you very much. Scott. Thanks, Saul. Um, I also will be quite brief. Um, I want to speak a little bit towards what Saul was developing in terms of stewardship. Um, I don't want to spend a ton of time on technical stuff. I don't really think it's the forum. However, that being said, um, I want to give a couple of quick examples um, where George Gordon is prepared to engage with the proponent in a positive fashion to ensure these stewardship uh, responsibilities are followed through on. Um, so my role in this, I am not a member of George Gordon First Nation, but I have been tasked by George Gordon First Nation to develop their stewardship capacity. In other words, using my previous experience in the environmental field to make sure that the stewardship obligations they feel towards the land are carried out by the proponent and ideally um, the proponent relies upon the expertise housed only within First Nations to conduct some of these activities. Um, so basically from the point of view of the proponent, a project such as this will have a number of environmental considerations. Essentially they're usually thought of in silos. In other words, what environmental responsibilities do I have in terms of, let's say, horizontal directional drilling? What are my responsibilities in terms of stripping? What are my responsibilities in terms of dealing with contaminated soil? Um, what I've learned, um, and it's being reinforced working with George Gordon, is that often these things can be thought of in a different sort of manner with the same outcomes, often better outcomes, um, and that's in terms of thinking about things holistically. So the project has an overall environmental footprint um, that will be defined through this process, and I understand why, and I don't disagree with it, but will be defined by identifying all environmental issues and then essentially um, controlling those environmental situations as much as you can. So one or two things I would like to bring up just in terms of how this may, um, this approach of course was required from a regulatory point of view, but taking a holistic viewpoint may actually add some value to what Enbridge can do um, in terms of making sure that stewardship obligations over and above what's written in regulation are upheld. Um, one, we've submitted obviously a, uh, a written argument. Um, these are all highlighted in there, so I'm not introducing anything particularly new, and I won't spend much more than a minute or two on each, but um, one thing that we thought was important was looking at the waste generated by the project holistically. In other words, each process involved with the construction and decommissioning of the pipeline will generate wastes, and the application as it sits now um, deals adequately with how these wastes should be dealt with, but 
there's likely to be some stewardship um, benefits and probably some operational benefits from saying, okay, what is the overall waste footprint of the project and how do we work within that project to handle each component of it? Um, so just, you know, really giving a very brief description of some of the waste streams that are all sort of considered equal. Um, there's drilling waste management through horizontal directional drilling. There's hazardous materials. These can be things such as asbestos or lead, um, asbestos gases or lead in uh, existing pump stations. There'll be contaminated soils. There's likely to be construction waste. Um, there's brushing and vegetation, which may not be identified as waste right now, but really is. And then it'll be general, or general waste generated through the construction. What are the best disposal options for each? What is the best place to take them to landfill or recycle or these sorts of things? And what would have the lowest impact on the surrounding stakeholders and communities? Um, one other one, and this will be the last one I'll bring up, is biosecurity. And Enbridge has developed a pretty comprehensive biosecurity plan. Um, George Gordon is quite concerned with the idea of biosecurity, um, especially insofar as club root could be something that could end up affecting traditional lands quite a bit. Um, club root is well known in um, the parts of Alberta where the pipeline right away is going. It is less well known and less documented in Saskatchewan, however, evidence is probably it is an issue, and I know Enbridge has done some club root soil testing. One of the issues with club root, though, is that even obtaining several dozen samples from a quarter section may miss a very uh, small outbreak of it, which then any machinery can pick up and move to another field and start a bigger outbreak. Um, so these are two areas that we'd like to work with Enbridge on developing some policy. Um, in so far as it affects the regulatory process, I don't know that it does a lot, but it does speak to the spirit of partnership that uh, George Gordon and Enbridge have cultivated thus far. And I would hope and expect that these um, discussions will continue. Um, I think that is about it for me, and it probably more or less wraps up our presentation, unless uh, Chief or Hugh, you'd like to add anything? Yes. Let's have a couple comments to uh, thank the uh, Elder Mike for his prayers and welcome each and every one of you. A lot of these uh, things I think about a lot of time for my grandkids and everything and, you know, uh, Solomon and Mike and everybody kind of touched a little bit on the history of uh, the relationship with Enbridge and um, other pipelines and other mines or everything like that, you know, like how they've... Uh, I guess let the government uh, manipulate, you know, our people and uh, give the, these uh, big corporation companies to you know, do, what, do whatever you want. Don't worry about the native people. You know, that really frustrates me, you know, because, you know, we have to live here. We've been living here for a thousand years. When, when you people are gone and you take all the money and everything, we're still left holding an empty bag again. So that really bothers me and it's been like that for for many, 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 many years. So all we you know, I'm I'm willing to work with any company, doesn't matter who it is, but uh, we need to be involved. We shouldn't have to live like third third world people. These are our resources. How can we not benefit? Why are we so poor? Like everybody's rich except us. Yet if this is our our lands, that's really frustrating for me. You know, but like I said, you know, uh, I'm more than willing to work with anybody and listen to what anyone has to say and uh, be willing. To, and I look forward to the future for my grandchildren because I see how my, my mother and my grandfather, what they were, how they were treated over the years. So what future does my grandkids have? So, you know, there's an opportunity for Enbridge and others to make it a, a different uh, life for uh, many First Nation people, for all First Nation people, and Inuits and others. You know, so with that, I just want to say thanks, and uh, we welcome uh, Mike for your prayers and everything, and thanks everyone. Thanks, you.
Chief? Yeah, I'll just make a few brief comments also. I just want to thank uh, everybody here that spoke, and Saul, and Scott, Hugh, and Mike. You know, it's uh, for us, it's important to be here, it's important to participate, because, uh, you know, as First Nation people, and uh, us um, occupying this land and uh, using it for all our requirements, all our needs, all the medicines that were ever required uh, for First Nation people were we were able to find all the food, all the resources, everything uh, to survive for thousands of years, you know, has been here for us. When we signed these agreements, these treaties with the uh, the, the Crown, we uh, you can see on the map how small the reserves are and how great the the land is, um, and uh, you can. Uh, Totally believe that uh, the First Nation people understood that there was, um, you know, all the the needs were going to be taken care of through education, through health, through housing. When you take a look at how small that reserve is, there's no way that we could ever have provided um, the needs for the the people at that time and for future generations. So um, there were a lot of promises made, um, and uh, these agreements were made nation to nation. And people wonder why First Nation people weren't involved in the beginning when pipelines were first created or when everything else was being done throughout the provinces, throughout Canada. The reason why um, they weren't involved, it's not because they weren't concerned. You know, growing up, I was always taught that, you know, we have to take care of our, our land, we have to take care of our resources, we have to uh, ensure that uh, there's things there for the future generations. Um, I grew up with my grandfather, Michael Longman, he was a medicine man. And uh, he had uh, always picked um, medicines from the ground and stuff, but when he took something, he was always sure that, uh, he always made sure to put something back. You know, um, it was their way of uh, ensuring that uh, there was going to be things for the, for the future. And uh, through their spiritual beliefs, you know, they put uh, tobacco in the ground. Whenever an animal was taken, they did the same thing, and it was just to... Uh, because of uh, such care for the environment and for for where they live, because they understood that was uh, for their survival. But anyways, getting back to uh, why uh, First Nation people weren't involved from the beginning was because of this past system, where First Nation people were required to stay on the reserve, and you had to have a pass to leave the reserve. And this was done by the government of Canada, but there was no law to back it up. It was like a totally illegal process. But they controlled the First Nation people by taking away their kids. You have to have a pass to leave the reserve to go to a residential school to visit your kids. You have to have a pass to go be at your daughter's wedding on an ex-reserve. And you were given a certain amount of days. And this was all, you know, there was nothing and and treaty to to base this on but it was just done and uh you know first nation people were always uh, oppressed and the plan you can see from the beginning was to just uh, take what they had and not include them it's not that we uh didn't have an interest in in being involved you know to uh, for throughout all the uh, development that's happened in canada but it was just a system of um, um kind of moving the first nation people out of the way and keeping them out of sight and uh, as a result, that attitude has been uh, passed on from um, government to government, you know, organization to organization. You take a look at all the past um, uh, prime ministers, and they all knew about this past system since the beginning, and they all knew it was illegal, but nobody made a move to change that. So that's why, you know, First Nation people have not been um, there and didn't have a say that they should have had a say. We should have a lot of say in this country, you know, and with, uh, with uh, our concern for, you know, the environment and our concern for the country, we should be uh, at a lot more tables than this also as First Nation people because there was agreements made. Those agreements are obviously not kept. And I always say, like, take a look at the map. Take a look at the amount of land that was given up. And as the elder said, um, it was only the depth of a plow. It was never meant, you know, for everything to be taken, all inclusive for five dollars a year. How could that be, you know? Taking a look at that uh, deal, just from 
any perspective, you see it's completely one-sided. But anyways, my point is, is um, you know, we want to be involved. We're glad to be here. And uh, um, First Nation people, like I said, would have uh, gladly been involved in a lot of development, a lot of uh, um, everything that went on if, if there wasn't this, uh, this oppression and this, this past system that they required. I just want to add to that, um, you know, First Nation people are definitely not lazy, like they've always provided for their people. How could uh, people be lazy and have survived the harsh winters living in teepees if that was the case? Um, it's, uh, there was always a desire to, to work and to provide for their families, but they even required uh, passes and permits to sell wood, to sell um, cattle. You know, they raised cattle and they weren't even allowed to butcher their own cattle. They couldn't even feed their own family. The Indian agents had to do everything. And this was kind of, a lot of that whole thing with the Indian agent was made up. The Indian agent controlled the reserves and controlled the people and he's the one who got rich. He's the one who oppressed the First Nation people and prevented us from, from taking our rightful place in Canada and being involved in a lot of decisions that are affecting our country, affecting our traditional territory. You know, so I guess uh, I don't want to take up everybody's time here, and I kind of begin to get angry the more I talk about that. So uh, I'll end it there. Thanks, Chief. Um, I think that wraps up our presentation. But of course, we welcome any inquiries from anybody. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your presentation. Enbridge, do you have any questions or comments? No, thank you for the presentation. We have no questions. And our can? And no, thank you. Thanks for the presentation. I was just wondering if um, you've noted a couple areas um, that uh, you felt you'd want to work together with Enbridge on uh, within the context of um, the stewardship of obligations as you describe them. I'm just curious um, if you have any specific suggestions on uh, on how the National Energy Board could support uh, uh, some of your stewardship aspirations. Well, I know that's a good question because I don't have an answer off the top of my head. <laughs> um, I don't know that the National Energy Board can directly influence that. I don't necessarily know the latitude because mostly what I'm speaking about is not uh, content it's concept so it's how are you going to take care of these things and what is you know what's your risk analysis how do you create your top-down um, plans to ensure stewardship rather than you know my my background is really rooted in regulation I understand regulation it's making sure that the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed when it comes to environmental issues, that's often a poor approach because you're only ensuring that the least good outcome is not achieved. You're not ensuring that the best outcome is achieved. And often, you know, in my experience outside and within First Nations, often working from a top-down approach of integrating environmental issues into every part of the project rather than as an add-on, you can get better outcomes. You often spend less money. And the level of reporting, recording, and stakeholder comfort is greatly increased. Because it's not something that's done to fill out a box or a report at the end of the day. It's something, you know, I think maybe there's a bit of a parallel that is evolving or has evolved depending on which sector you're in. But I think health and safety is something that one could use as a parallel. You have to do the health and safety before you start the project. Environmental is getting there, but it's not there yet. And I think that, you know, what I've been charged with doing is ensuring that George Gordon can meaningfully participate in stewardship activities in areas that they have some expertise and in areas that they feel are critical. And I kind of brought up two of them. They feel, you know, with discussions between us that these are two specific areas that have probably the greatest potential to introduce environmental liability, but are kind of... I wouldn't say they're inadequately addressed. I think they're adequately addressed, but I don't know if they're adequately conceived of. So I know that's a bit of a dance around your question, but uh, I don't know what the latitude of the board would be to change that sort of perspective. 
So I hope that helps. It probably didn't. But. Thank you very much. Actually, I think Saul's going to just add something here, too. I'll just quickly um, add, add to what you said. And I, I think that when we talk about um, the stewardship and how it's connected to Indianness and that responsibility, the powerful obligation that we have, not just for messaging amongst our community, but because of that real, there's a sacred obligation there. We, we move forward, we, we move forward down that, that understanding of who we are. And so, in a situation, like I mentioned, we had the energy board, since the genesis of the energy board, our band has never ever engaged the energy board or have been asked to engage the energy board. And I'm talking about 1959, I think, was the the time the energy board was first established. And, but we've always had this powerful sense of obligation, this powerful understanding of stewardship. And so, <clears throat> how did we ever make economics work for us when we didn't have an economy or a land base? We had to make that economic space. Same thing with the situation when we're dealing with a proponent is we build a great relationship with them so that we could make that space in order to accommodate and entertain that obligation of stewardship over the lands. And so in saying that, I suppose the Energy Board influences in an indirect way, but not directly, because I think that respectful responsibility lies with the proponent, I suppose, in terms of making that stewardship space, that environmental stewardship responsibility. I have a question, Saul, for you. I'm going to piggyback a little bit on, on Scott's presentation and his two examples. Can you give me some specifics of how you see what your role is going to be in the biosecurity with Club Root? Like, you're talking about working with the proponent, but how do you, what specifically do you see George Gordon doing? Well, I think when you talk about, um, when you talk about that, I'm talking about building capacity amongst our membership in terms to understand the scientific role that we have to take with respect to that particular issue. That there's regulatory rules that everyone has to follow that we need to know. In order for us to be effective in protecting our lands, we have to understand the regulatory roles that are in play. Just like being a First Nation person, you have to have understand a great, vast, comprehensive legal framework in order for you to defend yourself in Canada. But it's so comprehensive. Most people don't, we don't have the capacity, unless you're educated or unless you've been raised by someone who's strong in the treaties, are strong in understanding Aboriginal rights, are strong in <clears throat> jurisdictional issues. So when I look at the situation with, with respect to what you asked me, I see a certain responsibility devolved down to the First Nation that might have been contracted elsewhere or might have already been a part of the proponents internal capacity with dealing with this um, uh, with when dealing with club root but even uh, when dealing with monit annual monitoring for instance if you take a look at the energy east project they spend 900 billion dollars a year maintaining that pipe uh, uh, maintaining th they're going to spend 900 but uh, or, sorry, Trans Canada spends $900 million a year on monitoring. And then that's probably going to double, maybe even triple, if the Energy East pipeline goes through. So, but when you deal with First Nation people that want to step up and take, take on a responsibility role with respect to how we effect implementation of regulatory rules, 
then how much is the proponent prepared to devolve down in terms of the responsibility, but also the administrative costs. So there's a technical side of looking at making what we have in mind come about, and that there's a political side, there's a social side. So just like these indigenous rights, these Aboriginal rights I talk about, it's so comprehensive and vast, but it first starts with a great relationship. And I think that um, we have the makings of uh, we have the makings of getting to that point. Is just early in the genesis of uh, of this relationship. So, but I do understand the depth of your question and the technicality of your question. And from from your question brings questions to my mind that I know are scientific expert will help us to under, understand going forward. Thank and you. if I can be so bold, I mean, using a very specific example like biosecurity, it's, it's essentially getting George Gordon involved in the science end of it um, with subject matter experts and understanding what scopes of work they can actively participate in. Um, you know, biosecurity is not incredibly complex, it's incredibly sensitive, but it's a relatively easy scope of work to carry out. And essentially, it involves ensuring that there is no soil and no residue left on equipment that moves from one place to another. So essentially, it's washing. Um, again, a very simple concept, but incredibly important because if it's not done correctly, you can cause a lot of environmental liability extremely quickly. I think you answered my next question, Saul, but I'm going to ask it anyway. In your, in your remarks, you talked about the important legacy of this project, and, and I'm, I'm trying to write and listen at the same time and, you know, to get the scientific knowledge of the area, and I think that's what you were just talking about, but I want to make sure that when you talk about the, the, the legacy from this, the potential legacy from this project. Um, I should distinguish between, um, um, when I say legacy, I mean the traditional land use knowledge and ecological knowledge that we will derive from this based on our own internal methodologies that we devise from our end. That's a distinct, distinct element of this relationship that we value with the proponent. And so um, from this, like I said, um, we get to map, we'll map our traditional territories, we'll understand <clears throat> based on the ex external knowledge and wisdom of our elders precisely our interest over the land, not now, but in a historical context and going forward with the geopolitical tool that will be the traditional land use study and the ecological um, land use information that will derive out of this project. So that's precisely the legacy that I'm talking about. Um, as well, um, Line 3, Enbridge Line 3, a replacement program um, is going to ensure that um, certain opportunities may be derived for those First Nations that are involved or any communities, whether they're rural municipalities, cities or towns, they will be involved in opportunities and uh, First Nations also will want to be looking at some of those opportunities but first and foremost, like I said with us, the legacy is a part of also upholding that stewardship, responsibility, and obligation. Thank you very much for your answers. Um, I was going to ask Elder Mike a question, but I'll ask the Chief. We've heard this comment a number of times in presentations in the last week and a half. <clears throat> And again, I think I know what the answer is, but it's reference to depth of the plow. Could you explain that uh, for me, please? The, uh, the reference to the depth of the plow is um, when our understanding of the agreements that were made was that uh, the, uh, the people coming over when developing the land would only go to the depth of a plow that means that uh, it was, our understanding was it was all going to be for uh, farming and agricultural purposes. 
it was there was never any discussion about oil, about potash, about gold, about you know all the minerals, diamonds, everything that's under the land. The uh, when the First Nation people came to the treaty table, right? There was uh, limited knowledge about a lot of these things. So our position has always been. It, if that was not discussed at the treaty table, then that should not have been included as a part of what uh, what was given up on our end. What was discussed at the treaty table was what the agreement was. And there was a ma uh, many things um, that we understood were going to be uh, taken care of. And that's what I said when you take a look at, at our, our land base that we had agreed to take was such a small amount compared to what was required for us to sustain ourselves through hunting and through you know gathering and through moving from place to place um, Mike uh, Elder Mike McNabb there mentioned uh, one of the historical sites and you find those all throughout the province that's because uh, the First Nation people you know move from place to place and that was required in order to survive but when the treaty agreements were made and all the promises of health and education and even economic development were made, they called um, the Queen the Great White Mother because this was going to be like a mother taking care of her children and uh, you know otherwise they wouldn't have called her that but yeah we talk about the depth of the plow because that's only how deep uh, we were made to understand um, was going to be used for, for their agricultural purposes. Thank you very much uh for the entire, to the entire panel for your presentation today. It may not be the longest one we've heard, but it was very informative and, and uh, the panel appreciates your input. Um, if there are no other, are there any other remaining issues before we conclude? I don't see any. So, uh, tomorrow morning we start at 9 o'clock to hear the oral traditional evidence of File Hills Capel Tribal Council. Uh, when you're traveling home, please have a safe journey.